Get ready, there are some surprises to come, including the fact that neither of the two most popular cruises that you and I do, nor the port where I've had the world's best sail in and sail out, been good enough to make it to my top 11 list. Welcome aboard, I'm Gary Bremage. I've cruised at the time of making this 100 times, and I've found that there are just 11 that are so remarkable, memorable, and enjoyable that I think you should beg, steal, borrow, or like me, scrimp and save to do, but certainly before you die and while you can. Let's start with the one in position 11. It's the third most popular cruising region in the world, Alaska. The landscapes are dramatic, glaciers imposing, and wildlife magnificent. And on my trips, I've seen it has huge appeal for all ages, so it's definitely one that made the list. The highlights for me are Hubbard Glacier, where I saw carving of glaciers in Skagway, going on the White Pass and Yukon Train, in Juneau, going walking on glaciers, dog sleighing, and the tramway up to the top of the mountain to see the amazing scenery, in Ketchikan, going to the Great Alaskan Lumberjack Show. If you do consider Alaska, there is a huge choice because almost every single cruise line goes there, but note that the season is quite short, running from April to around about October. I'm always asked, which is better, Alaska or the Norwegian fjords? The latter only slightly pips Alaska, which is why it's in position number 10. It's rugged with high mountains, beautiful fjords, and it's going to become much harder to go to because from 2025, Norway say they will only allow total non-emission ships in two UNESCO World Heritage Fjords. Now the highlights in the fjords for me are visiting tiny towns deeper than the fjords like Skolden, Eidefjord, Nordafjordeid, then the bigger towns with gorgeous old buildings like Flambergen and Stavanger. I love the wide range of things to do like the train in Flam, RIBs, or boats going deep into the fjords, and hikes to places like the Pilgrim Rock. My big considerations, like Alaska, it has a main short season, also April to October. If you want to see the Northern Lights, you must go far north and at the end of the season, or you can even go in winter. There's also an enormous amount of choice with most cruise lines going there, but do look at the local lines of Hurtigruten or Havalia voyages. Next for me on the list is a Mekong River cruise through Vietnam and Cambodia. This cruise exceeded all my expectations. Such a different culture to what you and I know, and traveling on the river revealed how both the rural and urban people lived. I was exposed to fascinating but rather disturbing history about the Vietnam War and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, stunning temples, and three amazing cities. Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam's biggest city, Phnom Penh, the Cambodian capital with jaw-dropping royal compound, and Siem Reap, the gateway to Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat, oh my goodness. This is worth going on the trip by itself. The most incredible, sprawling, ancient complex. I also loved all the local craftspeople doing brick making, silver work, silk weaving, and all the different markets. There are many well-known European river cruise lines operating there, like Viking, Crossy Europe, and Amma Waterways. And watch out, because like all river cruises, though, at certain times of the year, it suffers from water level disruptions. Now I've done various European river cruises and the Danube is the one to do and the one that makes the list. I love experiencing the range of countries, the history, the cultures. Now a classic Danube cruise normally includes Germany, Austria, Slovakia, and Hungary. For me, the key highlights are the beautiful European towns and cities along the river. Now on my trips, this is usually included Passau or Nuremberg, uh, Linz with excursions to the Czech Republic's Chesky Krumlov, Vienna, Bratislava, and magical Budapest. Other highlights are going through the locks and the constantly changing local cuisine and entertainment that they offer and bring on board. The season is also short, from April to October time, but there are some Christmas market cruises. There is an enormous choice of lines. I've been on Viking, Emma Waterways, Avalon, and Emerald, but there's probably about, oh, at least another 15. Now, water levels can be a big issue some years. On one cruise, we couldn't sail past Vienna to Budapest because the water levels were just too low. Next is a Queen Mary II transatlantic between Southampton and New York. I've done this five times now. 
because it's the only true ocean liner sailing today. It's a truly unique experience, harking back to the glory days of crossing before you aeroplanes made it quicker and easier. No other line or ship replicates this. The highlights for me are the dressing up and the balls, although dressing up on Cunard is much less of a thing than it used to be. Incredible enrichment lecturers, often with famous authors, politicians, or actors, often in tea, which is a big, exciting ceremony, and of course, the opportunity to unwind, and finally, sailing into New York. Now, on that point, I much prefer going from Southampton to New York because you have 25 hour days for five days as you adjust with the time. And bear in mind, though, that there are three classes on board, Britannia, Princess Grill, and Queen's Grill, and the restaurant you eat in depends on which you're in. However, probably about 90% of the ship is actually open to everybody. It's not as class-based as uh, other lines, and it's not that class-based other than the restaurants. You can also, by the way, take your dog or cat, but that's very expensive. Cruising, I found, is a, a great and an easy way to see this historic and gracious country where English and foreign tourism in many areas is not that developed. Japan culturally and historically was an even bigger revelation than I expected for me. The key highlights, because I like history, were Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so seeing and hearing the impact of those awful Second World War nuclear bombs, seeing things like Mount Fuji, but the biggest for me was going to Osaka, which is an interesting place but it was the gateway into Kyoto and the magnificent temples like the Golden Temple, amazing place. I found doing a dedicated round Japan cruise is best out of Tokyo and several lines do it like uh, Region 7 Seas, Honda America, Cunard, Oceania, although most of the lines tend to go in the autumn to spring season with April, May time though being the spring blossom time, very popular and a little bit more costly. Iceland takes the next spot. I've cruised Iceland twice now. It's wild, weird, and fascinating. It really is an island of fire and ice. It's an expensive country, really expensive to do a land trip. And so going on a cruise is a great alternative, especially because the key sites are around the coast and the interior is kind of largely sort of a lava desert. The highlights for me are first the Golden Circle. This is out of Reykjavik. And across one day, there is Golfos, the Golden uh, Falls, the Giza geothermal area, Stroka, and the Thinkvelia National Park, where two tectonic plates are pulling apart. The other is what's called the Jewels of the North, normally out of Akarei, and this includes Godafoss Waterfall, Namaskard Bubbling Mud Pools, Lake Maivatan, and the Struksta Deer, hopefully pronounced that correctly, craters, the Dumburga Lava Fields, Everyone likes Reykjavik and the Blue Lagoon, although I think that particular attraction's rather overrated. There's much less choice of cruise lines here, and July and August are the most popular, but crazy busy, but it's still worth it. Next for me is the Tahiti and French Polynesian Islands. It's possibly the most beautiful place of all of these cruises. Now, Mark, my partner, says it's the most beautiful place and the best cruise that he's, he has ever been on. Every island is more stunning than the next. The highlight is the island hopping, and many lines, by the way, have either private beaches or their own private islands. Most of the time on this cruise is about enjoying beaches, maybe going hiking, going out on the water, or doing things like cycling, which we did quite a lot of. Bora Bora, of course, is the big highlight, but watch out because they have limited the size of ships that can actually sail into there now. Now, in terms of cruise lines, Paul Gauguin and Aranui, they're based there, they sail all year round. Windstar home bases for a big part of the year, but many of the big lines like Holland America and so on, they actually pass through too. The next is high on the list because it's so unique. The Galapagos. It has distinctive wildlife, mostly comfortable with humans because we've not been a big historic predator. It's a wild volcanic based set of islands, not quite as dramatic as Iceland, but it's pretty unusual. The highlight for me was the wildlife though, iguanas, Galapagos sea lions, birds like the red-footed and blue-footed boobies, frigate birds, Galapagos penguins, and of course the giant tortoises. Snorkeling was a really big highlight because I got to see underwater sea lions, sharks, rays, and turtles. But it's incredibly expensive to go there. And while it's rated so highly on my list, only go there if you're a big nature lover. It's a very long way to get there. It took me 25 hours coming from Europe. 
there's only around 90 boats that are allowed to operate in the area. Most of them are pretty small with around 50 or fewer guests. The biggest hold 100 like Silver Origin that it was on and Celebrity Flora. Right, you may be surprised by this next one being so high on my list. It's the Panama Canal. It is the most remarkable man-made maritime structure that exists in my view. So while the Suez Canal is impressive, the Panama Canal is phenomenal. It's an iconic trip that I think every single cruiser should do. The original canal opened in 1914 and a new bigger canal opened alongside in 2016. To pass the 50 miles from one side of Panama to the other side, the ship you're in is raised up 85 feet, that's 26 meters, in a series of locks. It sails through the man-made Gatton Lake along the Calibra or Galliard channel that's cut into the countryside. And then the ship's lowered back down to sea level by another series of locks. It takes a whole day to do this. I've done the full transit both ways and I've done a partial transit out of the Caribbean up to the Gatton Lake and back down. There are many, many lines that do it. They mostly do it when they reposition the ships to and from the Caribbean and Alaska because they have to go through there to get there. Many world cruisers include it and then lines like Holland America and I think Celebrity, they run those kind of partial transits as well. It's so memorable, it's so special, that's why it's so high on my list. So what is number one? The best cruises I have ever done by far is in the polar regions but specifically to Antarctica. While seeing polar bears in the Arctic was incredible, Antarctica still wins. It's remote, it's special, and everyone talks about Antarctica having changed them, and it absolutely does. It's way better than anything that I've ever had imagined it to be. The highlights for me were going to South Georgia, which has great history, but the scale of the wildlife is incredible. For example, on Salisbury Plain, I saw over 400,000 penguins dozens of elephant seals and many more animals. The Antarctic Peninsula with ice, snow, icebergs, penguins and whales, mind-blowing. It's crazily costly, even though it ranges from supposedly more affordable expedition lines through to super luxury seaborne Silver Sea Vikings, but whichever way you do it, it's expensive. But if you ever can find the money, it will be an investment in your life. I really, really believe that. So why on earth is the Caribbean and the Mediterranean not in my list of top cruises. Now these are fantastic places to cruise to, but they're not for me as much bucket list, life-changing experiences. They're places I love to go, I go there frequently, and they are great value vacations to be had. Also the most amazing and surprisingly emotional place to sail in and out of is Sydney Harbour. It's incredible for sure, but the others on my list pipped cruising out of Sydney and Australia in the end for me. Now if you find this interesting, watch this video where I look at the seven things that I've learned doing my first hundred cruises, starting with the biggest thing that changed my cruising experience and my cruising life forever. See you over there.